All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming to the first session track of the day and honoring us with your presence. Uh, we are here to talk about PHP performance, a subject near and dear to all of our hearts, I am sure. Um, uh, the topic is going to cover a little bit of like uh, the background of PHP performance and what we uh, the, the history has been there, and then we're going to talk about things that are um, on the horizon or just now possible to do, and uh, and we've got some benchmarks and some other neat things to share with you. Um, so who are we? I'm my name is Josh Koenig. I'm a co-founder of Pantheon. Um, I made my name in Drupal performance with this project Mercury thing, which was like a Amazon machine image with all the stuff cobbled together to do as about a good a job you could do in circa PHP 5.2 in making Drupal really fast. And uh, up here with me is David Strauss. He's our CTO at Pantheon, and he did Pressflow, which was the high-performance variant of Drupal for Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. Um, so, you know, we've got a pretty deep background in this stuff. Some, we know some of you, and I'm happy to meet more of you afterwards if, uh, if you guys want to chat. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask David, who's going to play the role of Doc Brown in today's presentation, Take us back in time um, to, to, you know, actually when we were first started working together, you could really call that the dark ages of PHP um, and set the scene. So uh, in the dark ages of PHP, the goal was to have as little run in PHP as possible. Um, and it still, it still is to a limited degree, but this w there was just no other option. You knew the PHP was never going to get better. And you knew that the frameworks were only going to get more bloated to cover the difficulties in PHP. So you would just try and yank as much stuff out of it as possible. In fact, this was largely the principle behind a lot of things in Pressflow and Project Mercury is the idea that uh, let's make these tweaks to the framework so that you can remove this part from PHP or remove that part from PHP. And um, the... The problem was is that uh, there was the ver a very stagnant upstream with a very broad downstream in terms of uh, frameworks using PHP. Uh, there was no upstream prog uh, progress because there was infighting, there was defection to other projects that were uh, sexier at the time. Um, and this led to really poor reuse options because there were missing language features and um, tools like Peckle and Pear uh, were just not convenient to use. The communities were fairly uh, insular in terms of people who could join those and release packages on those systems. And then that caused frameworks to bloat, which uh, is why if you look at, say, the Drupal 6 style way of working with databases, we reinvent a whole bunch of things so that we can uh, operate securely with the database system, whereas in Drupal 7, We've rebuilt on top of PDO, which is a fundamental language feature that provides a lot of the capabilities that we need. And because there wasn't a really good reuse and we had to build so much in every framework, there was a strong non to, not invented here syndrome that was proliferating through the community where each framework would reinvent these fixes on top of the language so that they could cover the gaps that were in PHP. And then this had the effect of repeating the cycle. It's, it's a reifying thing. The more discontent people can become with PHP, the more they leave the community for things like Ruby on Rails, Node.js, later Go, uh, things like that, uh, because they're not getting satisfaction that the fundamental core of where they're working was moving fast enough and advancing. Um, but fortunately, that is uh, well, changing. Uh, a couple other points on that. One of, one of the things... Um, uh, examples of this that come to mind to me, um, I don't know if you, I'm an old timer in, in Drupal, but at uh, DrupalCon in Copenhagen, we had Rasmus as our keynote speaker, and he was talking about the, making Drupal faster, and his suggestion at the time was to rewrite core components of Drupal in C and then load them in as shared libraries, which was kind of a, that was the best alternative anybody could come up with, and it would, that would have just continued to promote this kind of balkanization. And what happens when you have all of the talent in the community working on essentially reinventing the wheel to cover over uh, features that are missing from the core language in their various frameworks is the core language doesn't improve very fast. And that's also because they had, like, as David said, for a while a PHP core, like, you literally had people going in at late at night and reverting other people's commits 
Um, it's like classic poor, like o open source community um, uh, juju. Like in Drupal, we're very lucky to have a pretty awesome and pretty high functioning. There's lots of Drupal drama, but other projects have had it way worse at various points in time. And like the mid to late aughts was a really bad time for PHP core. They also had all this legacy, right? So there's like, all, there's still all this PHP 4 that's out there on like the crappy shared hosts of you know HostGator and Bluehost and all those things because it's like, you know, and, and they're they're people who are just never going to want to upgrade. And that that at a certain point that was really holding a lot of things back because that's that's pretty old stuff PHP 4. Honestly, that's like not very modern. Um, and then they, <laughs> they face these headwinds of like the other things in addition um, that were that would slow down development. But as you were alluding to, David, thankfully, um, this is no longer the case. And so um, there, this, this broke, fortunately, this, this reifying cycle. And uh, I think that uh, you could make a lot of arguments, but I think Facebook is largely to credit for breaking the cycle in PHP. And I think they broke the cycle when they decided to create a competitor to the Zend engine with hip-hop PHP. Not because hip-hop would become the runtime of many people. In fact, probably very few uh, production PHP implementations are running on hip hop or its um, derivative or its later incarnation HHVM right now. But the important thing is it refocused the community and it recreated urgency around making those improvements to the project, getting the community in order, getting contributions in order, providing the features that people would need in the base language so they would not have to continue to repeat themselves in every single framework with uh, filling in those gaps. And uh, it's actually kind of analogous to what I've seen happen with um, uh, the C language uh, with um, GCC with Apple's work on LLVM where they created a competitive open source compiler and that's much more broadly used uh, relatively than say hip hop is in the PHP world. But it created a competitive atmosphere where it was no longer sufficient to just have a large installed base and rust on those laurels and just have um, no progress shown for years. And I think the other thing you'll see is it's this notion of uh, competitive uh, implementations that are easily interchangeable drives innovation. And uh, the other thing I'd say, and again, credit to Facebook, prior to their even doing the hip hop project, they said, we are going to make a big bet on keeping PHP, which a lot of people laughed at at the time, because PHP gets like, people look down their nose at it, especially in Silicon Valley. But they said, no, we're going to do this, we're going to make it work, and we're going to go out to all the open source communities and like try to help them and get our engineering teams working together. And I think that also kind of provided a boost of energy. It's that a lot of the language features that we have also seen recently, not just the performance stuff, but like namespacing, um, improvements in the opcode cache to like not just be faster, but also be less buggy, stuff like that I think is a credit to that kind of push that they put behind PHP as a project. And that enhanced the ability to get more reuse going on in the community and enabled projects like Composer to be able to uh, have get traction. And the reason why at a PHP performance talk I'm raising this idea of code reuse is because there's a bit of a kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in terms of how people approach technology where optimization is somewhere mid to upper on that triangle. And on the base is kind of basically getting stuff working and getting it working reasonably well in your own little sandbox. And as long as everyone is completely focused on doing that, it's really hard to focus on harder performance issues because you don't have enough people who are using the same implementation to focus the, the optimization work. And you're too busy solving those other problems to be able to even spend your time working on optimization work. So long story short, um, PHP is no longer in a dark age. I uh, am trying to spread around the notion that PHP is experiencing a renaissance. Hashtag PHP renaissance. Um, so tweet, tweet that out if you like what we're seeing here. Um, there's a lot of good things that are going on. And, uh, and in particular, you know, PHP is the most popular language on the web. By a long shot, PHP runs more of the web than anything else. Um, and it doesn't get enough respect. And we don't have enough pride in ourselves as developers that use that tool. And the point is, for a long time, it was kind of in this iffy state, and it was a bit touch and go. But I think we can say now at this point, there's a, you know, nothing is certain, but I feel very confident that PHP is, again, on the rise. It is experiencing a renaissance and will continue to draw, be the most popular language on the web for many years to come. And we can all take pride in that and take pride in our work. So give yourself you know, a pound on the chest or raise your fist in the air, because PHP rocks. Um, 
So let's talk about speed. <laughs> right, that's why we're here. This is a, uh, this is a PHP performance uh, talk. You feel the need, the need for speed. Everyone knows this is very important. Um, as uh, uh, in the Dries note, we talked about uh, uh, the experience web. And a core part of the experience web is that it is very fast. Because your experience, when you have to wait for things to happen, is lame. That's been scientifically proven. And the, our page ranking overlords at Google will now penalize your website if it is slow. Uh, because they know that it provides a worse experience than a website that's fast, and it also indicates, like, if you have a fast website, you're taking yourself seriously, where if you have a slow website, you might just be some scammer malware guy. Um, so everyone needs speed, and we are going to be talking about speed at the runtime layer, um, which is just the PHP part of the speed equation. This is not everything you need to, uh, to make your Drupal website fast. I'm going to repeat that several times because I don't want anyone to get overexcited about what we're going to show here and think that it's just game over and you know all our work here is done. No, there's a lot of work to be done at every layer in the stack to make sure that Drupal is fast and responsive and that all of our applications are what they should be. But we have some good news to deliver today, at least on the runtime front. So what is this not about? This is not about caching. right? Cache does rule everything around me. It's caches all the way down. But this what we're talking about today is what happens when you are not caching. Um, so uh, to kind of reiterate what I said before in different terms, you should still be caching. You must cache. You must cache multiple times at multiple layers in the stack in order to have good performance, particularly for the front end. Because if you don't have, um, you know, most of the time when you're running a content-oriented site, you at least have Drupal's page cache, if not something higher performance like Varnish in front of your website that is going to deliver the anonymous page view almost instantaneously. As soon as a network request comes, at, comes in, as fast as you can blink, the response will come from the server. But your end user, right, so you have to have that in place. That's like table stakes now. It used to seem kind of magic, but now if you don't have that, you're behind the times. But to the end user, to your, your, the person who really matters, the person experiencing the web, that doesn't deliver anything until the page renders in their browser. And there is a whole field of front-end performance optimization that I actually know less about than I should um, that's incredibly important for delivering good experiences. Because you can deliver a response from the server, lickety-split, but if it takes two to three seconds for it to parse the DOM and load the necessary derivative assets and get everything together before it can paint the page, that's still a three-second page load, even if you responded in 20 milliseconds from, uh, from the server side. So this, this what we were talking about today, does, does only heightens the need for to be focused on front-end performance, because that is a make or break for the actual experience. Similarly, um, this does not obviate the need to be aware of your back-end performance, um, particularly on the SQL side. Like, the, SQL is the king of non-linear performance degradation, right? Um, most of the time at the runtime layer, if you get a bunch of traffic, things will slow down kind of linearly, just like it takes a certain amount of time, and if you have twice as many people, your capacity, it'll take roughly twice as long because people are just being queued and waiting. At the database layer, when things are going sideways, that's when your website goes from being kind of responsive to totally dead um, in a heartbeat. And that's because you can just you know, send your uh, 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 dis, you know, disk IO, other locking issues can crop up there. And what we're talking about now does not in any way ameliorate any of the risks of, uh, of SQL performance. You need to optimize your queries. You need to be aware of your slow queries. Um, if anything, speeding up your PHP runtime just allows you to throw more queries at the database at the end of the day. So it's very important to be aware that this is still key in, uh, in delivering good site performance. But this is about the PHP engine. And let me say, the new PHP has definitely got some muscle. Days to confuse, awesome reference for everybody. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so this is what we did, was we, we decided to do some benchmarking. I, I, I wanted to submit this talk originally because I had seen some relatively lame benchmarking um, that would, like, say, test uh, different versions of PHP and hip hop virtual machine on different systems and then claim, like, extremely uh, unbelievably different results. And then afterwards, the, and the comment thread of the blog post, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I, I realized on the second case, Nginx was just reverse proxy caching everything. And yes, that's why it's a thousand times faster, because you're not actually exercising PHP at that point. So we used um, our platform to do this test, and so we have a high degree of confidence that, you know, it's literally the same container, the same website, the same installation, and we're just swapping out the PHP engine in each case. Um, 
and I'll talk a little bit about what each of those tests was. Um, we used Panoply as our site, so it's not just a straight install of Drupal core. Drupal 7 core uh, is actually still very lean, and it doesn't have a whole lot in it, especially if you don't enable all the modules. And so, um, you know, uh, you, it's, it's fa Drupal 7 core, if you don't do anything else to it, is fast enough to make it not a great thing for benchmarking. Whereas Panoply has about 70 modules that come enabled. It's got a pretty thick set module stack of panels and, and all the other things you need to build a kind of neat modern site. Um, the site that we're exercising this on does not have a ton of content because we weren't interested in testing the database performance. We're particularly interested in testing the PHP runtime. The site that we tested this on has all caching disabled at all layers, except for the APC opcode cache, because that's a core part of PHP. Um, and we just did it with Apache, Apache Bench at that point, because we're just going straight through and seeing how quickly the PHP engine can respond to uncached page requests. Um, and I'll show a little live demo of how we did this, um, just so you can see. So like, I will toggle this site into hip hop, mode. This is some unreleased stuff that someday will come out. Um, and, uh, and then I need to do, because this is unreleased, I need to do a quick restart of the container. And I'm going to make sure that it's actually running <laughs> hip hop. It is. Okay. And then we would do something like, I'm just going to do 100 um, to make it quick. <coughs> But this is like the real world test that we did. And, and when we were doing the benchmarks, we spent a whole afternoon on this, just kind of repeating it over and over to make sure that we were getting accurate results and we weren't being, getting fooled by anything. And so in this case, uh, uh, HHVM, because it's just in time compiler, takes a little while. Like the first few requests are slower because it's actually just in timing. Um, and then that gets much faster. And then like we would do something like, okay, let's go back to 5.3. Um, and that takes a second. And I am we can speed that up with a restart here, I think. There we go. So now it's back on 5.3. And rerun the benchmark. Same site, same thing. You can notice that it's taking a little bit longer. Um, and that's, that's what we did, sort of with a little bit more rigor and more depth um, across the whole thing. And so we'll talk about the results of this benchmark. So PHP 5.3 with APC enabled and everything else tuned and dialed kind of you know the way the way that we have it so there's there's none of the none, there's no like gotcha in this in this in this setup. Um, in a long run of requests where everything has had time to warm up, um, uh, it averaged out to 11.38 requests per second um, and a 98th percent response time of 509 milliseconds. Um, and that's not bad, right? Half a second response time for an uncached page coming out of your Drupal site is not terrible. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of the best you could do circa last year, the end of last year uh, with PHP 5.3 and APC, well-tuned, well put together. Um, you know, you could, if you had different hardware or whatever, maybe you could get slightly better, or if you, you tricked something else out on the, on the infrastructure side, you could do slightly better. But this is a, like a pretty good runtime, pretty good setup. Um, and this is, so this is the baseline for our benchmark. Um, is just, uh, just over 11 requests per second and just under uh, 509 milliseconds. Um, PHP 5.5, uh, we're, we're planning on skipping PHP 5.4 because it mostly included new language features and not a lot of other stuff, whereas PHP 5, it doesn't, and it didn't really matter so much for Drupal 7 especially. PHP, uh, Drupal 8 will acquire at least PHP 5.4 because of those language features, but PHP 5.5 is out now, so why not just jump the chump and get with the hero? Because it contains a totally rewritten opcode cache that remarkably and noticeably impacted performance. This is the same exact site on the same exact infrastructure behind the same exact network stack and the same exact test, and it's like a little bit, almost 25% faster. We were able to get 14.3 requests per second instead of 11.3, and the average response time was down 100 milliseconds. 
Um, that's not trivial. That's a non-trivial improvement in performance, and that is a good signal for us. So, uh, and it's not that hard to run Drupal over, under PHP 5.5. There's just some of those things that you might have seen crop up as warnings or deprecation notices before. You might have to pay more attention to. But um, this is certainly a, an encouraging direction, and you can actually use this right now in a lot of places um, out on the web. PHP 5.5 is, is currently in wide distribution. Um, the last test that we did, which was the uh, Facebook's uh, Hip Hop Virtual Machine version 3.1, it's kind of badass. Um, we got 20, in a sustained test, we got 21.49 uh, requests per second, and our average response time per request was down another 100 milliseconds. So this is, if we go, if we go back, almost twice as fast as the current 5.3 state of the art. And with the release of PHP, uh, they had this in 3.0, but 3.1 has some other bug fixes. This is more or less, as far as we can tell, ready to run Drupal core um, out of the box. It works with Panoply. That Panoply site we went through and sort of dilly-dallied with all the features. Everything works. Um, can it make no uh, guarantees as to the long tail of contrib because, again, there's, it's a slightly different implementation. It requires you to kind of be on the more modern language patterns. But um, there is a lot of, uh, um, I think it is uh, realistic to be uh, excited about running Drupal sites in hip-hop and having at least the PHP layer of your performance uh, uh, problem improved by something like 50 to 60 percent in the relatively near future. Um, David, do you want to explain why that is? Well, um, a lot of it is that uh, uh, hip hop is, um, as a just in time compiler, is able to progressively optimize the actual execution of the code as those parts get busier and busier in the system. They're able to do things like type inference that can then propagate through the code. One of the worst things about the standard PHP runtime is that everything is a ZVAL, which is this kind of, um, it's to provide the loose typing. In this, at the C layer, they have this kind of container that can hold any type at any point in time. And then any time it's exchanging that around the PHP system, it's, uh, it's trading all of that information around, and it's possible for that to convert at any point in time into another type. Whereas on the HHVM, uh, another thing it does is with this type inference is it's able to work with much more nat native typing where possible, where if something is actually an integer and is passed around as an integer and continues to be used as an integer, at no point is there uh, a kind of string equivalent tracked with it or um, an array uh, um, container um, being held next to it as part of the data structure. And then um, one of the other big optimizations, and this has happened since the original compiled hip hop, was that they uh, completely changed the way that functions get called. In the standard Zend runtime, uh, all functions go through a hash lookup map where any time a function gets defined, it gets kind of pushed into this map, and then any time a function gets called, it tries to find um, the hash of it and then look up where to run that in the code. And that's a layer of indirection that affects every single function call. Whereas uh, ever since um, the compiled hip hop runtime, they've actually made um, standard uh, fully formed function calls where it's not being, say, where the name of the function is not being constructed out of strings in, say, the hook way, but you're just calling a function name directly. And they're having that work just natively. And these kind of optimizations go a surprisingly long way toward improving the performance of PHP applications. Especially something like Drupal, where you're, you, I don't know if you've ever dumped out a render array or something else, but we pass a lot of data around in Drupal as we're building pages and building responses, and we have a lot of modules, all of which are loaded with plenty of functions, and so it, you can easily see how given the way that the native Zend engine works, those tendencies in our architecture start to make PHP just at its raw computational level slower because it has to do a lot of this busy work, essentially. And uh, the architecture of HHVM eliminates that busy work, and as you can see, it has some pretty stark results. Um, so these slides will be available online afterwards if you want to check it out. If you want to tweet it out, that'd be awesome. So here's like your basic speed graph, which is awesome. Here's your scale graph, which is also awesome in terms of how, how many you can actually handle. Um, and this is what I'm talking about when I say PHP renaissance. 
right? This is, this is exciting stuff. This is, um, this is going to help us build stronger and better uh, websites that are more appealing to people because they provide a better experience by being able to respond more quickly to requests. If we think about things we want to do with Drupal 8 where we want to be able to legitimately run restful services that are going to be like, you're going to have a, like your mobile, even not even a mobile website, your mobile app on here could be talking to Drupal. Um, that RESTful service needs to be able to respond very quickly. Um, and a fast runtime is a really key component to being able to deliver a fast response to a RESTful request. And so it starts to make Drupal um, and PHP more and more legitimate in filling this role in sort of the overarching architecture of the web. And one area that we haven't gotten into in the, any of these benchmarks is that um, HHVM has a bit more controversially introduced a uh, supplemental language called Hack, which allows having this kind of typing um, and several other language features be more strictly defined and then be able to run alongside and integrated with standard PHP applications where PHP can call Hack and Hack can call PHP without a lot of trouble. And that uh, opens up optimization paths that are considerably uh, more sensible toward uh, projects like Drupal and Contrib than, say, writing a C extension to the language itself. Yeah, exactly. Like, better, better than Rasmus's suggestion. Uh, and the other thing is that, um, you know, uh, we're excited about this, obviously, but other people are already implementing this and making this possible. So uh, uh, the, the cloud software platform company Heroku recently relaunched all their PHP support, and the default is that you get this. Like, they, they don't want you to run the old version of PHP. They want everyone who's using them and building on PHP to use only HHVM and Hack because it's just they consider that to be, let's just make that the new baseline for how we do PHP development. And they have a, a broad appeal. I, I would expect to see other platform as a service, the generic P pass providers um, that, that offer PHP runtimes do more along those lines. Um, and I expect to see more things from uh, core framework groups like Symfony taking advantage of these features and so forth. Um, so it's really, you know, again, to reiterate, it's an exciting time to be a PHP developer. Our a rising tide is lifting all of our boats, and that's a very, very good thing, and it's been a long time coming, i got to say. Um, but I want to, again, close with the reminder that performance is a full-stack challenge. Um, you can't just swap out the engine and expect everything else to, 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 to work better. Um, you have to be aware and cognizant of each layer of the performance problem. Um, and so, you know, I start with, you can, you can start anywhere, but actually it's the weirdest place to start is in the middle because, like, if your front-end performance is terrible and the web page that you're delivering takes a million years to render, it really doesn't matter how fast the user gets that page because their in-browser experience is going to be poor and their, their web experience will be poor and they won't like your website. Likewise, if your database is slow as balls, then you're, it doesn't really matter how, how fast you can send requests to it because it's going to be slow getting them back out and you're not going to be able to deliver a good experience even if your front end is optimized. So you really have to have this trifecta of an optimized front end that renders quickly in the browser and gives a snappy experience and a good database back end that's like well-tuned and not abused. And then you can put a great PHP engine uh, runtime in the middle and then you're really totally cooking. Um, all right. So that's actually all of the, the presentation we have, but we're happy to take questions on performance, on our benchmarks, on these other things. If you want to do questions, please just come up and start a line right here. Hi. Mr. Sonnebaum. So uh, you mentioned you, that benchmark was Panoply. I'm guessing it was, say, like the front page anonymous user, right? Uh, front page on, uh, anonymous user, but with all caching disabled. Okay. Do we know how many I.O. calls were involved in that page? Um, not off the top of my head, but it's non-trivial. It's like something like a hundred-ish queries. Okay, it'd be great, like when you publish that, if we had that information, so we could see. Because I feel like maybe I'm a little skeptical whether that's representative, like that two times improvement, whether that's representative of like what most Drupal sites will actually do, because I think they will probably have more I/O calls. Um, yeah, that's that's an excellent point. So the 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 the. Uh, the uh, caveat on the benchmark is this is a, I, what, I, what I'm warranting is a 2x improvement in the PHP runtime portion of the equation um, and, uh, and not necessarily a two times improvement in your overall site performance. It may have to be actually a bigger than 2x improvement given the, the uh, IO overhead that's involved in there too to yeah. be able to cut the request time in half. 
Yeah. So so we'll but yes, uh, uh, we'll we'll pub follow up with like a blog post, and I will find that information because it's not that hard to get. Yeah. Have you run your benchmark on PHP NG? No, we wanted to do that, um, but unfortunately, we weren't able to get a, a build up and in place in time to test it last week when we were sort of pulling together all the numbers finally. But that's, we didn't mention that before, but the PHP NG is another exciting innovation coming out of the same space in the PHP project. I don't know if you want to talk it's, about it's that. It's also JIT based. Not really, um, no. but it is, um, so core developer, sorry. Um, so PHP NG is basically a branch of P the PHP runtime that attempts to simplify and make fa uh, uh, simplify a lot of the internal data structure, such as the ZVALs that you mentioned um, within PHP, uh, to basically improve performance and reduce memory use. Um, the inter certainly, the bench little bit of benchmarking I've done suggests it's quite a bit better, but I'm interested since you guys have controlled this much better. I yeah. was hoping you had numbers. We we actually that was in our original outline when we submitted the talk. That was like bullet. That was like the the fourth bullet point that we wanted to have, mm. and we just were not unfortunately able to get uh, a. a you know, we only had a, a one full day to pull all the benchmarks together, and we ran into a, enough like little snags in getting the, a, a build that we were sure was was correct together that we didn't do it. But I would love to be able to follow up with that. Sure. Um, and it is it is a very cool project. And so that uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is PHP NG is sort of this alternate now. But if it works out really well and people get behind it, that could become a default for like PHP six. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the hope is. Assuming it all works out, it'll get merged into master and then the major version number will get incremented and then a whole bunch of previously dead RFCs will become alive. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, other questions? Yeah, come on up. You, can, you guys can make a little line if you want. Have you guys, um, or are you planning to do any uh, Drupal 8 benchmarks comparing? Uh, yeah, I would love to do a Drupal 8 benchmark. I would probably want to wait a little longer because I know, but it, to be honest, that's kind of a sensitive topic right now. And, um, and it's not fair to look at something that's still like clearly in an alpha state and benchmark it and say, ah, oh, this is slow. Because there's a, like, part of what you get through when you get more people with eyes on things is optimizations. Like, everything we talked about is really optimization inside PHP core. My strong sense is that Drupal 8 has another, has like a similar like road of optimizations between now and the release candidates at least um, to go through to where you know you can make a benchmark. However, it wouldn't be a bad idea to if we could get, I mean we have some of this stuff scripted out, we could get it together to start doing some benchmarks and then after each release rerun them and just see if anything, what if anything has changed. That's cool. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, all right. Is any? Uh, He's coming. Oh, you're coming. Okay. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about PHP five five's um, warnings. Yes. Um, is there a good list and potential patch available for that? I mean, obviously, Drupal seven. It would have to be something that someone would have to add on. But if you wanted to eliminate those warnings, how? I mean, how bad is it? So, so the the. Um, uh, I'm not going to say that it's not a problem, because it is. Um, but it's not uh, the sort of thing where you uh, necessarily have to cons like think about, oh, are you, are you pulling something up? Yeah, this is just like the, the short list of like five, five backward incompatible changes. But just to give a kind of idea of like the kind of things that people encounter. Uh, a lot of it's stuff that has been long deprecated and should have been removed a long time ago. Like, you, I don't think that magic quotes were ever supposed to be used in Drupal applications. Uh, they've always been awful. Um, safe mode has been, uh, is more of a runtime configuration thing for hosting providers um, that was popular on um, crappy shared hosts. And uh, almost all of these have a much better alternative to them 
uh, or should not be affecting code that was written with best practices even as of 5.3. Yeah, the, 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 what I would say is by, um, by volume, in terms of if we're going to take the census of all the warnings that we see from, we even actually see this sometimes with people trying it in 5.3. Um, it's the things like you know, uh, an array that's being referenced without a proper index and other stuff like that, which is honestly a, a, a signal that the code itself is doing something improper because it's trying to reference a variable or referencing a variable that, that, uh, that doesn't exist yet. Um, those are the most common ones. They're not um, signs that like the uh, it's going to fall over, but they are things that would need to be fixed. The problem is that there's not a way to fix them in one place because what they are is places in contrib, especially where the contrib author has just you know done their work and it works well enough for them. But there's a little bit of uh, there's the, the potential to reference a variable that is is unassigned or reference an array with an invalid key, which previously in versions of PHP 5.2 earlier would just be null. Um, it would just say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. No. Um, and some people wrote code that depended on that. But that's not really a great, it's not good to, to make an assumption that you can ask for something. Like you should know when you're asking for something if it's going to exist or not. So I guess as a follow-up, I mean, how helpful would it be if everybody here started using PHP 5.5 because of that 10%? Oh, speed definitely. difference, I, I, and started I, filing bug reports against all of that for absolutely. seven and for eight. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So I, um, this is like uh, one of the ways I think we will be able to help contribute to this is by hopefully making this the ability to experiment with this stuff more and more easily available to people. But if you have control of your own PHP version now, I would definitely like. You might, it might not, it might be a very small amount of work, and even just getting to PHP 5.5 is a non-trivial bump in performance. That 20% is not something to sneeze at. That's a real, that's a real number that, like, if you're looking, like, when you sit down and you do a performance optimization or something, like, a 20% win you can get just like that is solid gold. Uh, uh, so I, I really, like, one of the takeaways from this is be excited for the future, but be ambitious for the now, because you can get a faster runtime if you get your site up on 5.5. Also, uh, Drupal 7 core should be already running fine with 5.5. Yeah, the issue in Drupal 7 is just some contrib modules. Uh, so you obviously ran these tests on Drupal 7. Um, with Drupal 6 still having some remnants of PHP 4, how ready is it to be run on hip-hop? I, I, I don't know, but my guess would be not very. Uh, there's... Uh, <laughs> There's at least one uh, regular expression uh, that's, I believe, still in Drupal 6 core with the deprecated um, regular expression support. Uh, I, I, it's not um, it's not the Perl compatible. E-reg? E e E-reg, yes. Yeah. And I don't think that's ever been written for hip-hop. So at least that line of code would probably just cause a fatal error. Uh, not massively hard to replace or avoid if you can, if you need to, but... Uh, I would say if you're working on performance for your project, then um, I, I, Drupal 6 is definitely going to hold you down. But if you want to try, I mean, you, it might not be that hard. <laughs> like, I, like I said, I don't know. It's just a guess. Um, have you run any of these tests over sustained periods, like hours or multiple um, multiple restarts, you know, in incubations of the, the PHP runtime over a long period of time for things like you know, degradation over time or stuff like that. And also, did you track memory usage or memory um, consumption? Because honestly, for my systems, the, the memory usage is my limiting factor, not CPU or even code performance. Um, you know, memory uh, right now is the most expensive resource for me to acquire. Hmm, interesting. Um, so uh, the, the, the answer is, did we try this over a long period of time? No, we, we, we tried it with, uh, uh, the longest one I ran was like 10,000 requests. Um, so that's a sustained barrage that, lasts, that lasted like 15 minutes. Um, and the thing is, at that point, you know, uh, if, and given our knowledge of the system, I'm not trying to load test this. This is still just the same like concurrency level five. So this is not like, let's keep adding more people to see where the, the system breaks down. It wasn't a stress test. This is just a benchmark. And my, my feeling is, or and, and my understanding, my experience is, if something holds up and is steady for like 10 to 15 minutes, I mean, it's a computer. It's going to do the same thing the next 15 minutes and the next 15 minutes after that. What would change it is if like you doubled the number of people or something else happened. But there's no, um, there are no known issues with like sort of memory leakage or other runaway things. I did not check the, the memory utilization values for these, so I don't have that. That's another thing we can consider throwing in as well as the marks request for the back end queries um, that were resulting from this. Um, right. I would be curious though, if you're in, if you feel like you're in a memory constrained environment, you should work with whatever 
wherever you get your memory from, because that shit is getting cheaper and really fast. Uh, memory is the new disk, uh, is what everybody else says. So you should be able to get more memory with less money. Yeah, a, a lot of the, the what we benchmarked was influenced by the fact that we're CPU constrained for our application servers. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, optimizing the PHP layer is, is a great step, but you also mentioned the database layer and um, cache and other, other. So in your experience, having a great hosting environment and where you, when you deal with Drupal sites that are non-trivial, that have complex structure, a whole bunch of nodes, what are the, the you know, the top five bottlenecks that you see that are not, I mean, that maybe the, the whole conversion to 5.5 .5 or hip hop wouldn't make a dent. What, what are the typical things that we are doing just plain wrong? So the, the, the biggest things are um, uh, with larger sites is uh, when you have a lot of data, it's relatively easy to click around and configure a view that will make your database server very unhappy. Um, because views is kind of just doing the best it can to give you what you, the things you need, but it's not a DBA. Um, and when you have a few hundred nodes, it'll actually almost always work fine. Um, but when you have like 100,000 or a million nodes, that may no longer be the case. So that's, that's common. The other thing that's common is, um, you know, again, hearkening back to the Dries note, we are increasingly in this world of integrating extra external services. And we really need to develop better practices around how and when and we do that because one of the things, you know, larger sites typically do integrate many external services. One of the things you need to be aware of is because PHP is a blocking language, anytime you attempt to integrate an external service, you create the potential for that external service to hold up a page request, hold up a PHP thread. Um, and so uh, a, a less thoughtful external service implementation can sometimes become a problem for sites. Um, and then the, 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 the pure, pure front end performance. There's other like weird Drupal gotchas that come along. To me though, there's not really like any one thing. It's usually the first thing is, um, are you bound on your database? If so, then that's the only thing that matters to work on. Um, and until you're no longer stuck, uh, until your database is, is happy, it doesn't make a ton of sense to focus anywhere else unless you also have very poor front end performance because you can cache to cover that and then work on the front end and, and get that resolved. That's kind of the general gist of it, I would say. Thanks for the update. Uh, do, can you share your thoughts on both PHP as a long running process and Drupal as a long-running process on PHP as a long-running process. So do you mean PHP as a long-running process as a, like an act, a single PHP script or like an FPM? Um, yeah, more like an FPM. So F FPM is perfectly fine as a long-running process in terms of it being a supervisor of PHP processes that are then running scripts or web, or you know, website traffic. Uh, none of the actual requests that are going through the PHP runtime are long running usually for, for things with FPM. And uh, I believe FPM even has configurable lifecycle for the sub processes that it's managing in the same way that uh, Apache can with mod PHP for discarding it in case there's any kind of memory leak in that, which often there is some. Um, for running PHP itself, like where you've written, written a .php file and you're executing it in some sort of long running capacity, I don't know if I would recommend that right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how about Drupal on top of all of that? Uh, it's, uh, same thing is true for Drupal. That uh, I would say that um, the closest you should get to a long running process with Drupal is where you have something that is maybe queuing up things and then there's a worker that comes along during Quran and is working its way through a handful of queue items, but in a way that is not necessarily long running, like it, not necessarily working its way through the whole queue, maybe capping it at some number of items or some duration of time before it exits and then picks it up in another run of the script. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Hello, thanks for the uh, talk, it's certainly entertaining. Um, one of the things we run into is that it's really easy to scale sites out horizontally when you're dealing with a large number of requests because uh, you just throw a bunch of servers and CPU cores and so on. But then sometimes when you have content editors hitting a site or you're just doing local development, we've all seen scenarios where you've got like one out of your 16 cores pegged with CPU doing 
all of the compute resources, and it's just not very efficient as far as trying to thread anything at all. And I know, like, on the Drupal and PHP app side of things, you know, we're not writing a multi-threaded application, but is there anything on the HHVM side which tries to make better use of sort of the multi-core architectures that we have? I, I'm not currently aware of anything that actually distributes a single request to multiple cores, but right. I could be wrong. So, yeah, as far as, like, the benchmarks you've got right now, you're basically going to have the same results on, you know, a two-core versus an eight-core system with one request at a time. Uh, yeah, but so for, for a single request, that's true. Um, uh, but obviously, you, uh, you, most websites are serving yeah, multiple yeah. concurrent requests. But, yeah, there's not, not at this moment anything that uh, breaks up uh, uh, and, and takes a single request across multiple cores that, that we're aware of. Um, it's certainly, you know, uh, if, you, if you're seeing that type of process where the CPU really is your bottleneck, just speeding the runtime is going to have a, a, a good effect on that. And, um, uh, yeah, having a single page request take it to 100% of, of one core could be... Could be bad. Yes. But, yes. You know, if you make it fifty percent faster, then it's you know fifty percent of a core. Hopefully, HHVM has been optimizing in the opposite direction, though, which is uh, to be able to make one core more effectively able to juggle multiple requests through um, async primitives. Hey, so uh, you guys mentioned that PHP is a blocking language. And knowing that Node.js is coming up and that PHP has things like React coming along to make it non-blocking I.O., do you guys have plans to investigate anything like that for performance or have you already? Or well, HHVM does have non-blocking I.O. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Did you run any tests on that? Or? We, the, we're, we were not testing using any of it, but it has APIs for that. Okay. Uh, I personally think Node.js is a terrible language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, it's the non-blocking. I, I, so yeah. We're in a world where, where every server we're getting is getting more dense in, the core for, in, the, in terms of the core distribution, and the job of a runtime for an application is, just, is to distribute that workload out to as many cores as possible to take advantage of that horizontal scale in modern systems. And the basic Node.js philosophy is let's pack everything possible into one core, one thread uh, that is uh, event-oriented. And if you want to distribute it out to multiple cores, they have some hacky ways to run a ha uh, multiple processes on the system and then distribute requests out to them that we've, we've actually not find, found reliable even though we use Node.js for a few of the things at Pantheon. And I just don't like that at all. And, um, and then, of course, it's being built on top of V8, which is a Google-managed project, and Google has, does not consider V8 to be really a server-centric, um, just-in-time uh, system. Uh, so we've seen bugs in both Node.js and um, V8 in terms of things like memory leaks for long-running processes, which is just how event-oriented applications like that operate. So... I, I don't think it's that great. I've, uh, I've even written code in that, even in CoffeeScript, that's supposed to make some of the coding constructs simpler so you don't end, end with a mess of callbacks because I, I think it was apt when someone said callbacks are the new go-tos. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's just not, it's hard to create maintainable code on a large scale uh, with the way that Node.js operates. Uh, uh, I was going to say, does that give you trepidation then for projects like React, which are supported by Symfony, so you could kind of see them bubble up in Drupal 8, which would make PHP kind of that same form as Node.js with lots of callbacks? Um, I think callbacks are terrible. <laughs> yeah. I, and I've done twisted programming, too, with callbacks. And I ultimately think that the first language that really handles things well in terms of looking like you're writing um, blocking programming and has things being properly juggled by an event handler at the core of, of the runtime in a way transparent to the actual developer is the thing that's going to take over and really bring uh, event-oriented coding to the masses because one of the most expensive resources on projects is developer time. And it sucks to have a language that developer productivity takes a huge hit for uh, when uh, they're coding in the normal way that that language forces them to operate. Thank you. Any more for any more? Uh, all right, cool. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thanks for attending, uh, hopefully tweeting about the PHP renaissance. And uh, let's go ahead and make the web faster. Woo!